Well, welcome to a new episode of The Harsher Reality. And today I'm absolutely thrilled to have with me Rory Sutherland, uh, the veteran British advertising uh, guru, philosopher, uh, and the author of the wonderful book, Alchemy, which I've read more than once, and as you can see, is discolored from uh, repeated... Um, usage Ooh, lovely. Uh, <laughs> so welcome rory and thank you very much for for taking the time absolute pleasure really fantastic rory so i like to start with um, an overarching question which is you know before we get into alchemy and creativity and the the need for it is to ask the question what are the core beliefs, the core problematic beliefs that underpin um, reductionist logic um, in in the modern world, in 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 business, and in life more generally? As you, I, su- I suppose the um, the and in a way, calling them beliefs may be too strong a word because they okay. may just be assumptions or actions. Uh, as I said, unthought assumptions. Yes. But they'd include things like kind of the linear deployment of logic that, in other words, what is good in the short term is also good in the long term. Yes. Okay. Which arises, I think, from the model of the world as a machine, as a mechanical device. Yeah. Uh, A second one would be that by optimizing the parts, you will automatically optimize the whole. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, and a third, you know, so, you know, there are assumptions about time that if something is better in the short term, uh, it, you know, it is better in the long term, uh, which isn't always a safe assumption in a complex system by any means. Yeah. Um, you know, there are things in a complex system you should actually kind of de-optimize, e.g. building buffers into a system, for example. Right. Um, uh, uh, and... Uh, uh, the, the, the you know the bet that you can effectively solve problems by splitting them into their component parts and solving each. There are things I call Sudoku problems, and I call them Sudoku problems because you can only solve a Sudoku by looking at the whole grid. There's no division of labor possible with a Sudoku by mm. chopping the Sudoku into nine squares, handing them to separate people to solve, and then fitting it all back together again. It yeah. doesn't work because the things are interdependent. Yeah. OK, and probably also a belief in kind of tendency to equilibrium, mm-hmm. whereas anybody who studied evolutionary biology or indeed any of the biological sciences, uh, ecology for that matter, knows that there are uh, effectively there is always the potential in complex systems for Fisherian runaway. Yes. And that things actually uh, things will actually d- depart from equilibrium quite rapidly. And that the process over time is absolutely not a straight line. It's, you know, lots of these things might be sigmoid curves and so on. And so this belief that the world, and another one is the belief in averaging as a useful vehicle. So there are quite a lot of, when you actually dig down into neoliberal economics, for example, which is really a reductionist project. Yeah. um, You realize that the assumptions on which it rests are incredibly many. And it's unbelievably likely, except in special circumstances in the physical sciences, it's extremely unlikely that all these um, conditions are met. I mean, if you take mainstream economics, okay, the assumption is that uh, individuals are possessed of perfect information and perfect trust and are engaged in effectively optimizing their own expected utility uh, 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 through a series of standards. With extreme self-interest. With extreme self-interest, which also translates into collective interest, which, of course, it sometimes does. Let's be yes, honest about that. OK, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not um, the Adam Smith insight is really important, but he qualified it and his followers didn't, perhaps. Yeah. Um, uh, with extreme self-interest, um, guided by an invisible hand, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the assumption of the single representative agent strikes me as a really, really dangerous one. Yeah. The other, in other words, you can somehow construct this single homo economicus yes. and optimize for him or her, 
Yeah. Well, well, of course, it's it, isn't it? Because it would have an average gender. It would have one testicle and one ovary. Yeah. OK. And you would optimize for that. OK. And therefore, by doing so, that's the best way of optimizing for the entire system. Yeah. That's whack. I mean, and it, so simply because you can do it in these very rare conditions where where um, you have all the all the data you need, the metrics for the in which the data is shaped are actually entirely representative of what's going on. And you can find unchanging laws yeah. which determine effectively the relationship between these five or six variables, two or three or whatever it may be. OK, in those special cases, then undoubtedly the reductionist mindset has proved a great success. You know, I don't necessarily want poets um, designing my aeroplane. Yeah. OK, I get, I get that. Right. But at the same time, it's led to a huge opportunity cost and a huge misdirection of effort where we pretend things are physics problems where they're simply not. And of course, anything involving human psychology has immediately moved out of that realm. Yes. OK. And Aristotle, Aristotle, you know, who's kind of like the founding father of science, makes the point that, um, you know, uh, science works where things cannot be other than they are. Gravity. OK. Yes. You know, you, there aren't any places on the planet. Well, actually, that's not quite true, actually, because uh, I, I once worked as an advertising agent for a company which made extremely accurate scales. And they have to correct for your location on the planet. But of course, because the Earth isn't completely spherical, oh. uh, the force of gravity varies slightly from place to place. So GPS, so, but, but but nonetheless, nonetheless, yeah. in that case, for most practical purposes, when flying a plane, you don't need to correct for that. Okay, but in but um uh but you know there are certain universal things like you know the the, the boiling point of water at a certain pressure point. Okay, at a certain atmospheric pressure is a kind of given. You know that's that's that. Okay, yeah. but there are large things where science is inappropriate. And the attempt to appear scientific is actually a misdirection of effort, which is those many, many areas of life where things can be other than they are, where they will change both under direction and encouragement. And indeed, they will automatically change anyway under their own steam. Yeah. Yeah. And this and these are the areas where you 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 use the phrase uh, psychologic. Psychologic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Psychologic. It's, it's, it's you can't. You can't attempt to say if you lower the price, demand will go up. Yes, it's not a safe assumption. Now, you know, that that's probably one of the most basic foundational assumptions of economics. Um, but uh, and by the way, it's true more often than it isn't. I probably say that. Okay, yeah. that the balance of probabilities are such that you will sell more of a product product if you reduce the price of that product. Uh, there are cases where that's untrue, many cases where that's untrue. There are also cases where it, it may be true on average, but completely untrue for the target audience as a whole. Yeah. Uh, so someone once said very shrewdly that actually, although economists assume there's a kind of trade off between price and quality, actually markets tend to divide into people who are quality focused and people who are price focused. Sort and, of you know, and so this is why premium economy is a relatively small cabin on the plane. Mm -hmm. yeah because they're people who just basically want you know the best possible thing they can have um possibly because they're not paying but also yeah. because they're bloody rich or whatever yeah, okay yeah. and they're people who just you know broadly speaking i'm you know i'm in that rare class of people who actually think premium economy is quite a good trade-off but at the, then there's a huge way that people without whom you cannot fill your plane who just want the cheapest flight Maybe they want the cheapest direct flight. They're not prepared to go via Addis Ababa and have a 12-hour layover to save £17.50. But nonetheless, they're primarily price-focused. And of course, given that the plane is an assemblage of all kinds of different people, mm -hmm. OK, uh, it's all very well saying we're going to just have premium economy and we're not going to bother with economy and people should pay the extra because it's a hell of a lot nicer, which it is. OK, the problem is that you'll still have a chunk of people who basically are just trying to get there as cheaply as possible and you won't fill your plane with premium economy seats. Someone else's plane will get filled. Yeah. And when we... so immediately you've introduced complexity to the dynamic there. And what I notice repeatedly, and I've noticed this in advertising, which is a strange place to notice it, is people who've studied biology, genetics, any of those kind of sciences where you think in terms of systems or ecosystems, you don't think in terms of machinery. 
Yes. Those people tend to be better at solving advertising problems. Yeah. So obviously what we are talking about... Oh, by the way, another yeah. assumption is proportionality, that the scale of intervention will have some bearing on the scale of the effect. And one of the reasons to be optimistic about complexity thinking is that if you know if you can find one butterfly effect, okay, yeah. you can actually achieve spectacular changes in behavior, for instance, from relatively small interventions. Absolutely, and the linear, the whole linearization of the world. The whole linearization is yeah, yeah. Mm. It's a it's a kind of sort of a, a fixed proportionality, and you see this all of economics. Sadly, I studied economics. Uh, oh my uh, goodness, and, you're recovering. Like yeah, you're being deprogrammed. Yeah. Mm. Well, it is what it is, and you know, all <laughs> uh, uh, for the better uh, in the long run, I guess. It is the obsession with sort of uh, linearization, and you know, mm. Nassim Taleb has sort of talked about. Yeah, he, he's he's been absolutely clear, clear that both averaging and the assumption of the bell curve, uh, you know, the normal distribution, yeah. have been catastrophic in all kinds of. Um, I mean, I, I regard him as the, in a sense the mathematical and statistical founding father of uh, a kind of new discipline that's starting to emerge. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, his ideas, are, in retrospect, they're so simple once you understand them, but you need yeah. someone to point it out. And this again goes to, you know, your point about psychological solutions and, and human perception and the way we relate to things and, and non-obvious things being hugely revolutionary but they have to be pointed out or we have to discover them uh in the first place i mean i think i think there are things where the return on effort is very high just getting to competent is a good place to start yeah okay what i do is get to competent and then leave 20 percent of the resulting gains or 30 percent of the resulting gains from competence to searching out the incredible for, to the experimental process of looking for the extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And so those are the, you know, those are the two things. I think, I think you need a separate mentality, just as bees. Th there's the thing called the explore, explore exploit trade-off in mm -hmm. algorithm design. It's also a very common debate in animal foraging, because you don't want to be 100% exploratory. You don't want to be 100% exploitative. You have to find a, exploiting what you already know as opposed to discovering what you don't, okay? Yeah. Both of those are, you know, both extremes are catastrophic. There's some sort of trade-off required. The nature of that trade-off changes, by the way, when you have something like the waggle dance or, or the invention of speech or the invention of just pointing. And when you have a social species, Arguably, they can shift m more attention, I think, to explore rather than to exploit, because both the risks over time, both the risks and the opportunities are shared, which makes possible a greater degree of variance in your behavior. Mm -hmm. And actually, we often ought to be optimizing for variance, and we're instead we're optimizing for uniformity because of this problem with a single representative agent. Yes. And you talk uh, about economics... Uh... I mean, I'll give you an example of this. Interest rates, right? The basic blunt tool of changing interest rates when you get a bit of inflation, regardless of what's caused the inflation, which in this case is like the invasion of Ukraine and, you know, a whole bunch of COVID-related disruptions to supply chains, which may only be temporary, by the way. Yeah. But then you look at interest rates and the effect on people of interest rates entirely depends on who they are. OK, you know, old people with a lot of savings probably like, you know, I mean, young people like a bit of inflation, bluntly speaking, because they're indebted. Yeah. Old people like high interest rates. Yeah. Why are you preferencing one group over the other? And why are you disproportionately punishing the poor when for situations entirely beyond their control, which are probably not anything to do with the standard form of inflation anyway? They're caused by, you know, external shocks to the system. Yep. It's a very, very weird response. And it only makes sense if you basically believe in this representative agent fallacy. Yeah, yeah. So economics, you talk a lot about economists and their flawed assumptions, mm. uh, which, and they are flawed, and there are a lot of economists, in, <laughs> in, in, unfortunately, in, in positions of uh, influence. So when you, you've been around... I, in you know, fairness, you can't totally blame them because... I was going to. I was going to. Um, when okay, when the information, mm. when government information is presented at an aggregate level, like GDP growth. Yes. Okay. 
with no actual attendant information on how that GDP growth is apportioned or how it's distributed, okay, then to some extent their brief is optimize that. You know, I mean, there's an, there's an argument that economists have done more damage not as acting like economists, but in terms of setting those metrics based on economic assumptions that then cause, because let's face it, you know, if you have low GDP growth in the UK or if we slip into recession, it's a massive news story. Yes. If we have high G GDP growth, but which is unevenly apportioned, then that's a positive news story for the government. Yeah. So you can hardly, you, you can't entirely blame them because unless you actually have a more nuanced conversation to begin with, okay, about what is actually a good society, which yeah. takes you into the realm of philosophy to a degree. Yeah. Um, and uh, then, uh, then the conversation is nonsensical to begin with because it's based on daft assumptions. So it's almost like it's a, it's it's a it's a. I mean, to use a hackneyed word, but it is. A, it's a paradigm. So the economists are part of it, but the reductionist paradigm, uh, the, the the fixation on narrow uh, or limited, um, what is it, uh, KPIs indicators is is uh is uh is a paradigmatic problem and yeah. one of the things i'm wondering about or you've been alive for longer than than i have for example when you look at the evolution of this of mm. this problem let's call it a problem um what is your sense is it rapidly intensifying well Okay, there's a bit of reduction. As I said, there are fields where reductionism works and there's fields where you can reduce things to fairly comprehensible algorithms. So yeah. let's let's take my story of the bees, okay, which is that bees have discovered the explore-exploits trade-off. And the reason for explore is, A, you might get really lucky. If you want to grow, you need good fortune. And you won't actually grow if you don't increase your surface area exposure to positive upside optionality yes. okay so that comes under the realm of explore then there's the stuff you've already discovered which is the explorer bees have gone back and done a bit of a waggle dance and informed the hive that there's quite a lot of pollen and nectar and i think there's something else they collect as well is it resin or something okay but there's quite a lot of a valuable raw material okay uh previously unknown yeah. at a location one mile to the northwest okay yeah. it's actually relative to i think the position of the sun or something but don't, don't get me into that okay now at that point once you've made the discovery and then you also do the dance for a length of time equivalent to the importance of the find so that the more important your find is the longer you dance the longer you dance the more bees notice your dance yeah they don't, they don't bother to they don't bother to clock the actual length of your dance they're not they haven't got stopwatches OK, it's just that if you dance for a long time, lots of bees will notice it and they'll all go off to the northwest. Yeah. And if you only dance for a couple of minutes, it'll be far fewer bees. Yes. So that, OK, but then uh, uh, once you once that explorer bee starts dancing, you can reduce to an algorithm that part of the problem. OK, which is basically. Um, uh, you know, go go and fetch pollen, make sure that energy expended in collection is less than value of raw materials acquired. Now we're in the realm of kind of spreadsheets and accountancy. Do a dance in length equivalent to the value of what pollen remains. OK, yeah. Yeah. rinse and repeat yeah. that part of the process. You can actually reduce to a pretty. You know, I, I could probably write it down. I'm not very clever, but I could probably write it down, you know, certainly not in these fields. I, I could probably write that down myself, basically. What are the informational components that are necessary for exploit? Yes. Explore is a much tougher thing to make a business case for because it's, it's longer term. Mm -hmm. It involves a certain proportion of totally wasted journeys, okay? It's absolutely essential that, the explorers share their discoveries because if the explorers keep their discoveries to themselves um then um the system doesn't work yeah okay so there are there are certain components which you can say are necessary but it's much harder to, to actually make the case for the value of exploration which is all manner of things like resilience exposure to upside optionality the option of growth the option of discovery um and also uh, you know, knowing where you go next, knowing where you direct your attention next year rather than last year. The future is always much more debatable than the than the than the present or the past. Yes.
OK, and so confining yourself to short term measures effectively allows you to uh, fe effectively set, you know, remove all of those uncertain variables. It gives you a very strong sense of certainty. Yes. But unfortunately, that sense of certainty, as bees have discovered over 20 million years, is also medium term fatal. Yes. But it's medium term unlucky and, and long term fatal. Yeah. I mean, I'm in a position at the moment in the advertising industry where I think the creative side of the advertising industry only knows one way to make money. And it's algorithmized that, OK, where effectively the accountants have taken over the hive. And as a result, the uh, the medium to long term demise of creative agencies, I think, is certain unless we start experimenting, unless we start reshaping the explore exploit trade off. But if you're principally focused on your next quarter, you're not going to do much explore. Yes. And and it's 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 actually worrying because the advertising industry, as I've learned from you, not that I've had much exposure to it, is, you know, but when you reflect on it out, out of the box, it's it sort of it isn't surprising that it, it's it's a home like the arts for for more it's creative. a mixed you know it has to be a mix, and there's you know uh, what's happened is people have fallen in love with the media part of the business which you can reduce to algorithms yeah when you tweak these algorithms there's a problem with these things too which is when you when you algorithmize something and you formalize it or even reduce it to code which is mm. an even higher form of uh, of algorithmic kind of behavior yeah first of all you make cost savings okay because you don't have to think so much OK, secondly, that process generally yields short term results and gains. Yeah. Unfortunately, the endless pursuit of that process um, effectively runs out of road. In other words, the scope for improvement diminishes and diminishes. And the uh, 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 and then it becomes effectively so monolithic that it actually is heavily exposed to threats in the marketplace. Absolutely. And, and you talk about. Um, in alchemy, in, in your book, a defensive decision making, mm. and which is very rational, by the way, which is very rational, and yeah. I suppose the the taking of quick wins in the mm -hmm. short term um, and being able to explain them versus presenting something that is a bit more elusive is, so, as you say, rational, but but is is to the detriment of ultimately everyone, I suppose, in the long term, except, except it's not really true what I'm saying, because the people who are involved in making these decisions would be negatively harmed because of the sort of cultural paradigm if they were to present it differently. So yes. The question, the yeah, question yeah, I yeah. Suppose, so what, what, hap what happens is that um, typically a company is founded by an explorer. Yes. Okay. And then bit by bit, you know, well, you can see that, okay, Steve Jobs, okay, and Johnny Ive, you know, give way to a great guy, but he's the finance director, right? I mean, he's an expert in kind of supply chain optimization. Badly, yes. <laughs> All right, let's be candid about this, okay? And what happens is the, no, you know, I imagine it if bees had much personality and weren't kind of you social or whatever they are. Yeah. Um, uh, or optimally social, is it pro, I can never remember which way around it is pro social or you social, okay? The exploiter bees and the explorer bees would hate each other. Mm. And there are more exploit bees, quite rightly. You know, it's right that there are more exploit bees because it's absolutely stupid to discover a new source of pollen if you haven't got the wherewithal to go and harvest it. Not yeah. the bees technically, you know what I mean? Okay, yeah. right. Now, the, the problem is then that you develop a culture which is competitive around exploitation. In other words, it's cost control, it's balance sheets, it's quarterly reporting, it's efficiency focused, okay? And, and how very, efficiently, very how efficiently, but it's also myopic, it's potentially dangerous, and it's incapable of innovating. Now, I was talking yesterday to Nestle, and I did give Nestle one big high five, which is that as a very large organization, they managed to create Nespresso, which is a billion dollar business. OK, it's fantastic. I'm a massive Nespresso loyalist. I'm off caffeine at the moment for, for I have a small operation. But I mean, under normal circumstances, I'm one of their kind of I think I'm Nespresso club member number like one one six oh two or something. OK, but. 
But it's incredibly rare for those large organizations to do something significantly breakthrough unless they're absolutely pressurized into it. Okay, let's be fair. Large telcos have reinvented themselves as broadband providers. Okay, but I mean, that was a kind of, you know, fairly linear step, which they were forced to do because they realized that if they were a landline business, uh, you know, they were on a road to nothing. So uh, under conditions of extreme fear, Large companies can reinvent themselves. Cunard brilliantly kind of when the jet engine came in. OK, mm. Cunard, which was a transportation company competing for the Blue Ribbon, which is the fastest west to east crossing of the Atlantic, suddenly realized, OK, once the jet engines come in, competing for the Blue Ribbon is a bully mugs game because you can fly to New York in a day, albeit refueling at Gander. OK. And... um. They reinvent. They reinvented themselves. They said the ship has to be the destination, or a large part of the destination. And in the process, they kind of invented the world's cruise ship industry. I mean, part invented it. You couldn't give them the whole credit, but they were instrumental in creating the cruise ship industry, which didn't really exist, ironically, before there were jet jet planes. Okay, I mean, there were. I mean, there's a book called The Ordeal of Gilbert Pinfold by Evelyn Waugh, where he kind of is a passenger on a freighter. You could do that kind of thing. OK, so, you know, there were sort of ships which also carried paying passengers, yeah. but it wasn't a big business until Cunard was forced to kind of rethink the whole uh, business they were in. Mm-hmm. And similarly, you know, the broadband business in which BT is a big player in the UK. Where are you, by the way? I'm in London, in Hackney. In Hackney. So, then, you know, BT's done a pretty good job, I have to say. You know, I mean, I, I, nobody ever praises large organisations, but I had two years of lockdown during which my home broadband went wonky for a total of 26 minutes in two years. I have to say that's pretty damn impressive. Absolutely. OK, you know. Credit has to be given where it's due. You know, you, I think we ought to give credit where it's due. Nobody ever goes, hey, I, I mean, I, I, I've got a lot of I've got a, I've got a lot of love for large chains in uh, by the way i'll always defend starbucks and costa coffee and i'll always defend like holiday and express and my explanation is these chains are really important in the overall ecosystem not because they raise the ceiling okay nobody ever goes you know you know uh you know if you want the the ceiling of coffee you go to shoreditch and they're like three hipsters with interesting body art who spend you know like 25 minutes making you a bloody pour over no whatever but they raise the floor OK, if you want to be in the coffee business, you want to be in the hotel business. Well, if you're not at least as good as Costa and if you're not at least as good as uh, Holiday and Express, well, you're going to go bust and great, because what that does is it gets rid of the kind of, uh, you know, the undergrowth, as it were, you know, the weeds. Absolutely. OK, it effectively weeds the marketplace. Great. You know, I'm not I'm not one of these people who goes everything has to be small. I think there's a role for those people as well. But what tends to happen, as I said, is that the dominant culture becomes one of cost control. And then you're left with these disciplines like marketing, okay, which have to look at the future, which have to look at possible worlds, which are now then frozen out of strategy in many cases. You know, someone will develop a strategy based on market sizing, all using data that comes from the past. And then eventually they hand it over to some marketing people and say, we want you to market this. Yeah. Okay. Well, at the very least, you should forge, forge your strategy with marketing in the room. But I don't think that's even happening in most cases. Now, marketers, you know, there are a lot of wankers in marketing. There's an awful lot of wank spoken, OK? But to some extent, the wank is a necessary feature of dealing with complete uncertainty. It's part of the creative, you know, yeah. process. You're, you're, dealing, you're dealing in a probabilistic universe where you have to make... Um, uh, it's technically called uh, uh, Roger L. Martin explains this using the philosopher from the 19th century um, called Charles Sanders Peirce. But it's effectively abductive inference. You know, it's Sh- Conan Doyle in a Sherlock Holmes story using the mouthpiece of Sherlock Holmes calls it reasoning backwards. In other words, it's not here we are. Where do we go next? It's we want to get here. What could the prior conditions be that lead to the? what would have to be true in order for these conditions to be met? OK, and in the same way, in detective fiction, if you think about it, it's reasoning backwards. We've got a corpse. We don't know who did it because that would be very boring. If you witnessed the crime, it would make for very boring detective fiction. He stabbed him. Although there is a very interesting form of detective fiction, by the way, which is called um, uh, it's called a, not a whodunit, but a how catch em, of which the, um, the the supreme exemplar is the series Columbo. 
Now I know you're Sri Lankan, but this is the other. This yeah, is the yeah, other yeah, killer. I, I haven't. <laughs> okay, I, um, and um, uh, mm-hmm. what's fascinating about the, the how Catchem is that every episode of Columbo started with a film of the crime being committed, and then you simply had to work out. Uh, along with Columbo, how he's going to spot what really happened yeah. and, you know, not arrest the person who's being cunningly framed. Yeah. So that's called a how catch and not a who done it. But but the inverse reasoning is what were the prior conditions that most make sense of the fact that we now have a body on the floor with a knife in its back? And that involves a process like detective work, which is reasoning backwards and is much more exploratory, much more recursive which is why evolution is, of course, basically random recursive selection. Okay, and and and, and the market, the and the market. Okay, you know, I mean, the glorious thing we were talking about this. I, I belong to this sort of evolutionary group of of um, uh, evolutionary biologists, including David Sloan Wilson. And one of the stories we always love is because I, I told this story, and they said, "Well, funny enough, I've got the, the same example in my book." Is the location in a town? where six restaurants fail in a row to a point where you think that's just cursed. Okay. All the past data indicates you can't make a success of the location in this restaurant, in this lo- a restaurant in this location. And then what happened in Seven Oaks is there was, you know, there would always be this restaurant. It's on a hill. You had to park down hills. You had to walk uphill. It wasn't in a particularly inviting space. The parking was really difficult, you know, bloody, bloody, blah. And every restaurant failed. I'm sure some of them were quite good, but I hardly even bothered to go there. Yeah, And then the guy who ran, I think, a kebab shop decides to open an upmarket Turkish restaurant, spotting an opportunity uh, called Hattusha, actually, which is the capital of the Hittite Empire, fascinatingly. And um, I, I was going, oh, please, God, don't do that. You know, you've done so well with your existing business and, you know, everybody's failed. You know, it's cursed. You know, it, 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 I, I just don't want to watch you fail again. And the bloody place is heaving. OK. Wow. And it's just, you just got to change one ingredient. So generalizing about what's bad, okay, is a really dangerous thing because sometimes what you think is bad is the location, okay? And it is a bad location, but it turns out that with the prospect of high quality Turkish food, people are prepared to spend a bit of hassle parking and walk uphill. That does make sense to me, actually, in a funny way, which is that, Okay, let's be okay. So I imagine you eat quite. I'm I'm stereotyping you, but I imagine you still eat some Sri Lankan food, which is fantastic. oh, I I, I eat Sri Lankan food. I, I love um, Sri Lankan food. I even cook it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, because it's fucking brilliant, right? Yeah. Okay, and um, which which restaurants do you recommend in London for your listeners? Andy Rory for Sri Lankan food. Um, I haven't really. I, there, there have been a few I've been to, but in the past four years, three years, I haven't been to since COVID. I haven't been to a single Sri Lankan restaurant. But generally speaking, I think relative to Indian restaurants, uh, the quality seems to be low. So there's a gap in the market. If I had nothing better to do and uh, some extra money, I would consider. I think you can get it delivered if you go to um, Dish Patch, for example. Okay. D i s h p a t c h dot co uk. I think there are a few Sri Lankan because um, they're those kind of dumpling based curries, aren't there? And there's some fantastic. It's a fantastic. It's also a good bit punchier. But um, I think there are a few good restaurants that will actually deliver. So you effectively, oh, I mean, they you. deliver. What? Well, I, I don't mean deliver like Deliveroo. They actually deliver overnight. So it doesn't matter where you live in the country. Got you. I, you know, no point in me. Talking. Also, they're sort of small scale, more sort of home, homely type. Uh, someone cooking some food and and get, and, and and selling it. So, so the, the point is that maybe, okay, okay, I have to admit, okay, I have often used the phrase, you know, I'd kill for an Indian or I'd kill for a curry. I like pizza, but not quite to the same extent, okay? Yeah. You don't, so it's possible that the kind of food like Turkish food, that ethnic food creates a kind of craving of a fo- with a force that is significantly greater than, say, you know, a good pasta dish. Yeah. For, certainly for people like me, not for everybody, but there are enough people like me who'll go, I don't care how difficult it is, is to park, I'm going to fucking eat that stuff, right? Okay, because mm-hmm. that's what I want to eat. Whereas, you know, where, whereas I don't think, obviously French food, you know, it's it's it has its place, you know. <laughs> I don't totally, I don't totally denigrate it, but it's not a pie, is it? You know, let's be honest, okay. Yeah. In terms of making, you know, and likewise, we all know that kebabs are basically, you know, a kind of craving food. You know, there are certain moments in your life where only a kebab will do. 
Um, this is probably a bit of a Brit, a Brit thing. No, 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 absolutely. I think yeah. I, I so, so, been... so it's probably it's possible that it's possible that actually there was nothing wrong with the location of the restaurant. It was just that if you're in, if you're in a, if you're in an awkward location, you need to have a particular kind of cut through food. Something with oomph to yeah. draw emotional with emotional And that's power. that's in the field of psychology, whereas restaurant location is probably in the field of sort of algorithm design, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So when we think about, I, I, interestingly, you probably won't find, it won't be news to you, but I I often, when I think of Nassim's work and I think of your work, I, I sort of, I often recommend alchemy and anti-fragile together, uh, for example. So one of the questions... Well, I don't, let, let, me, let me come clean. I, I couldn't have written alchemy without anti-fragile and without fool by randomness. I couldn't have written it. OK, hanging from the shoulders of giants, absolutely clear admission for two reasons. One, I didn't have the necessary information. I probably had it at an instinctive level. I thought that these people are actually thinking about this the wrong way. But I, I had the instinctive feeling, the gut feel, but I didn't have the ability to give it voice. But yeah. secondly, I didn't have the confidence to voice those opinions until someone actually with real serious mathematical chops actually said it first. <laughs> Understood. So, you know, I would hope that, you know, I, I, in terms of influence, that book is probably a bit of a kind of Sergeant Pepper or, a, uh, you know, the Velvet Underground with Nico. It's famously said of the Velvet Underground uh, uh, that that um, only their first album, that only 500 people bought it, but every one of them started a band. And, um, you know, there, there are musical uh, acts which are influential much more than they are. Although, having said that, and it seems, I'm delighted to say, sold really, really well. They were massive bestsellers. But actually, I think the the market he's created for rethinking our models of reality and our paradigms, I think the market he's created there is is actually, you know, many times bigger. Absolutely. If if there were if there were proper a proper system of royalties, you know, the you know the Velvet Underground would have been a really really rich band. But unfortunately, you're only paid for the the albums you sell, not the bands you help to start. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although, although I think nowadays, they if 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 they play covers, but it's not clear to what extent these these bands played covers of of Velvet Underground. But anyway, that's another. No, 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 no. no. I, I, and um, the other thing is, uh, <laughs> the the other brilliant thing with the Velvet Underground is there's some really weird footage of um, uh, on YouTube where Mo Tucker. OK, who after being in the band effectively became a Georgia housewife and joined the Tea Party movement. <laughs> so she's speaking at some tea or she's being interviewed at some Tea Party rally, making sort of highly conservative parts. And a lot of people are going, hold on a second. <laughs> that's the drama from the Velvet Underground. But that's, by the way, that is absolutely characteristic of genuinely original people. Don't expect them to play the party line, like Morrissey or whatever. Don't expect them to play the party line on politics because that's not what they're there for. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. OK, Bowie, et cetera, you know. Yeah, absolutely. OK, um, don't 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 expect them to, you know, go along and just go to, you know, slavishly uh, mouth platitudes because that's not their, that's not how they roll. And just absolutely. just accept that. OK, you know, um, and um, uh, the um, but the, the the really interesting thing there, I, I often worry about this, which is if you look at activities which are lucrative and activities which are economically valuable, uh, there's overlap. But um, there's also a surprising amount of stuff which you could make a much richer world if only there were ways to be rewarded for doing it. So in the course of my life, if I actually ask myself, what's probably the most valuable thing you've done economically, as opposed to what's the most profitable thing you've done, it's probably just introducing people to other people. Yes. Now there is a business you can make out of that, but actually it's called like the conferences and events business. Yeah. And the people who actually do the introducing actually are paying to be there <laughs> rather than getting paid. Which is a bit weird, but I mean, you know, the number of times where and the second most valuable thing you can do undoubtedly is teaching. I mean, this is one of the things that worries me, which is that teaching creativity, which isn't that difficult to do, to some extent, people are in, innately creative and they've had it beaten out of them because yeah. they've been exploiter bees and they've been trained to be exploiter bees and they've been promoted for their ability at, as an exploit. OK, they've from been the first selected, grade, from they've the been first selected grade. for their ability to exploit. OK, and their creative instincts have been kind of suppressed for reasons of social conformity, I think. Yes. So I don't think it's that difficult to teach creativity. And I don't think I don't think the, the quality is that rare. I think I think it, there is an innate 
you know, there are path dependencies in it and there are probably genetic and other factors. But I, I certainly don't think it's, it's it's difficult to make the world more creative. Just I don't think it's impossible to make the world a bit more numerate, you know. Yeah. Um, and the gains to that over in, in terms of the overall economy would be much, much bigger. But to get back to Nestle, as I said, you founded this. OK, IBM did it again. They had to create a sort of separate vehicle for doing it with the PC division. But the amount of the amount of what you might call unforced innovation in large companies, as distinct from reinventing landline as broadband. Yeah. Um, is much lower than it should be, because one of the advantages of being a big company is that. Uh, like one of the advantages of being a big beehive is you can afford more exploration. Yes. Okay. And yet they haven't done that. They've been taught by the, uh, you know, by some extent, you know, that will possibly their misunderstanding of the investor community and so forth. And, you know, the domination of the finance director and the finance function and what's now becoming finance has now become an organizational function not I mean, a it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a systemic it's a systemic mm. problem and uh, when i brought up anti fragile the the where i was going with that um was to ask you when we think about large organization there's a structural reality in that the, the, the reality of scale and size and size and you know people actually people talk far less about bureaucratic problems now i mean the late david graeber but you know in the 60s and the 70s people like you know, James Burnham, Pornell, uh, the Peter Principle, you know, it, it, the market was full of books on, on the problems of bureaucracy. But, but, but anyway, so the problem of the, the structural problem of size and then obviously, you know, skin in the game. Nassim. I mean, I, I have a certain sympathy with the Brexit movement. I voted Remain, but I, I refuse to become a fanatical Remainer. Partly because I think one thing the Brexit movement was right about was that people in positions of power perhaps unsurprisingly have a absolutely um religious attachment to the idea of gains to scale and um there are, there are there's a trade off between scale and variance and variety okay there is a trade off between big and uniform and small and varied and i'm not sure that europe the, the magic of europe as a continent going back 600 years has been in its actual variety not in its scale Absolutely. you know you know if you if 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 you fell out with your german princeling you moved somewhere else you know you know all these people sort of you know you know you'd always get sort of london would be a kind of generally being quite liberal would you know you'd suddenly get you know Peter uh, Kropotkin and um, uh, you know uh, you know anarchists pitching up and goodness knows what else. Yeah, yeah. But actually, I'm I'm not sure that Europe's there to be a United States. Um, that actually, in the medium to long term, it's more valuable as a variegated thing uh, than it is as, uh, as you know as a collection of interesting experiments. Yeah, explore rather than exploiting these efficiencies. And I think. Uh, but the other, the other reason I think, by the way, you're not unreasonable in voting uh, to leave is because it was the only chance you knew it was the only chance you're going to get in your lifetime to get out of this thing. Since you believe the governmental class were perhaps unnaturally committed to European political integration compared to the populations of not only the UK, but other European countries. OK, if you believe that and you had one chance in your life to get out, well, the precautionary, prin precautionary principle tells you to vote leave. Yeah. So, OK, imagine you're booked on a cruise in three years time. OK. And half of your friends are really keen on Bavarian umpar music and they're really keen on going on a cruise you know which uh is focused on bavarian umpire which actually happened by the way it's a fantastic court case in germany where right. two people at the last minute just two ordinary members of the public were booked on a cruise ship where everybody else on the cruise ship was basically a um they they, they realized something was a bit strange when they were the only people boarding the ship without musical instruments <laughs> okay so everybody else going out the gangway was carrying like a euphonium or a you know a, a, a a post, you know, some massive sort of brass instrument. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is a bit weird. I come, I come every, you know, and then they basically had to spend seven, seven weeks. I think it was seven days. It might have been a fortnight trapped on this cruise ship seven with weeks basically twenty-four hour bloody Bavarian umpar and thigh slapping. Okay, yeah. right. And if you know, if it comes, if you only have one chance to actually recover your deposit, 
okay yeah. and you're rather suspecting your friends are going to take you on that cruise well what you'd like to do is you know leave it a bit longer see if they change their mind okay you know maybe they'll change their mind maybe they'll actually go on that cruise where i can go and look at the um you know uh the uh you know the parthenon or whatever it is okay or, or you know the delphi or hey, whatever choose a mediterranean thing not an unparthian cruise yeah okay? yeah but when it comes time to pay the deposit and, you know, once I pay this deposit, there's no getting out. Locked. That's when you get out. I, I don't think many people wanted to leave the European Union in 2016. I think there are a lot of people voting to leave what they thought the European Union would become in 2038. You know, yeah. I don't, don't think, I don't think it's an irrational thing to do. You know? and, Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So, so, so to di dismiss that as irrational based on a very, very narrow conception of what are the variables at play was a shocking, a shocking piece of evidence of the stupidity of the governmental and kind of media class, in my opinion. Yeah. And also the focus on, you know, it's a complex topic. With, with I mean, I voted, As I said, I voted Remain narrowly. I wasn't particularly enthusiastic. I'm not really sure. You'll know this. You're, you're did I, I, I voted Remain, but in retrospect, only because I didn't actually have the time to <laughs> delve into it. So it was a sort of status quo. Uh, I, I actually didn't, for that, I can't remember what I was up to. I was sort of I probably shouldn't have voted. That would have been the moment. I'll also, I'll also blow a bit of smoke up your ass here, which is that, A, I don't think, and this is not about necessarily by choice, I don't think the, the UK is really a European country in that sense. In the, the way that I don't think Scandinavian countries really are. Uh, OK, I don't think it's a European country. We'll always be a cultural outlier, largely because of language, but also because of kind of globalism. I'd also make the point, and this isn't a, a deliberately designed to flatter you, but I find... If if we're being absolutely honest about it, Commonwealth immigration has been a hell of a lot more valuable to the UK in making it bloody interesting than European migration. Potentially, potentially. Yeah. Oh no, 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 no. I, I, uh, I mean, you know, you've got to include. By the way, you know, if you look at say, okay, now Cyprus is a bit confusing because it's part of the EU and it's also part of the Commonwealth. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's there, there's a general um, finding, by the way, that both free trade and free movement is most valuable when it's actually most varied. Oh, I see. So, you know, so actually, you know, the gains to free trade with countries that are quite similar to your own yeah. are actually much less pronounced economically. Because you're, 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 you're creating you're replicating. Kind of alchemy, then, a, a pot, a bringing yeah, in. Yeah, it's a bigger pot. And you're probably creating a huge bureaucracy as well, which undoubtedly the European Union was doing. I mean, you know, that fact that bureaucracies always become self-serving and grow yeah. and grow and grow in power influence and, and in just general corruption actually so you're talking about the principle of distance when there's when the, when the distance mm. is, is distance meaning not geographically but also correlated where the distance but, but our really big problem is we speak english which makes the whole thing asymmetrical because yeah, there are there are you know a billion people who can move to the uk and do my job well, I, mean, I hope, I hope no. that I'll, you know. <laughs> okay but if i move to poland i'll be sweeping the streets right because yeah, I, you know other than very few specialist international companies what can i do i can't go and just i go. mean this is why i'm here right i'm sure no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also for our fantastic weather i mean you know <laughs> exactly so so rory when when we think about so the structure and size and, and the problem of skin in the game, which is sort of not the founder not being, not being the one in charge. Mm -hmm. It's not obvious to, to me. No, so what so the solution, so, what 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 we can do to 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 mitigate, because it seems like we need scale in certain in certain areas. We need big organizations. Oh yes, yes, and also there is an advantage to scale, which I think is underrated, which is gains to specialism. Okay. And what people do is they make organizations larger. And instead of going, the great thing about being big is we can now afford to employ specialists. OK, mm -hmm. they they tend to look for scale efficiencies. Mm -hmm. OK, which actually generally means redundancies, by the way. OK. And th the person who sort of well, undoubtedly understood this uh, first woman and until recently, the only woman to win a Nobel Prize for economics was Eleanor Ostrom, who makes the point that. Um, the design of institutions is very complicated. And so she I think it was something like the Kansas City or Police Department or something like that. Yeah. And what she said was, you do want a specialism around forensics. There's no point in every precinct, OK, having um, uh, effectively um, its own forensic department. Mm -hmm. Something like that that's highly specialist where, you, you know, you, you, you really need people who are really, really expert at like doing fingerprints and dna analysis and all that sort of stuff okay you, you need that centralized 
But then what happens is people don't do that. Instead, they go, uh, because they've got a cost-cutting mentality, instead of going, we've got an opportunity now to set up a really good forensic department, okay, and be much better cops. Mm. They then start going, well, if we didn't have all these individual police precincts, we could just have the police employed centrally to police the whole, you know. Now, once you get rid of the precincts, a whole load of things break down because you've got above a certain, you've probably got above your Dunbar number, okay, yep. right? Uh, people start taking sickies because it's less noticeable if you're not pulling if you if you're not pulling your weight. Okay, you lose all the local knowledge, which is I mean, if you have a police precinct, probably seventy percent of bloody crimes in a precinct, someone goes, "Oh, it's fucking Dave again." <laughs> okay, because they just know. Okay, they know who the whole you know they have all this kind of tacit knowledge and kind of learned knowledge which comes from focus on a particular area, which gets destroyed if you then centralise. And so the problem is, is that scale combined with cost cutting is almost certainly actually quite damaging. Scale combined with op optimism and opportunism might be a really exciting thing. But scale, when viewed from an efficiency mindset, not an opportunity mindset, basically leads to kind of versions of the Dorman fallacy, which I've, I've, I've talked about a bit. I, I mentioned that Dorman fallacy in my book as a kind of, oh, yeah, I might as well put this in as just... And I didn't it's wonderful, and it's so it, true. It's it, so it, true. It, it's also becoming more true with the advent of AI, because the truth of the matter is people won't use AI because it's better than humans. They'll use it because it's cheaper than humans, and they'll pretend that the role of a human is much narrower so that the human can be replaced with AI, OK, um, uh, 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 and um, and so we can see AI basically being it suddenly is no longer just the dormant fallacy. It's like the you know, it literally is the housekeeping fallacy that, you know, the, the concierge fallacy, the, the check in desk fallacy. Mm. Until you, you arrive at these hotels, which are basically slums, but highly automated. Yeah. So what, what you're saying is, you know, scale, we need scale and it's not necessarily I mean, scale has its own inherent features but what you're saying yeah. is it's the size it, 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 it changes the rules it, cha it, it, it fundamentally so what people do is they have a very simple simple monolithic idea of gains to scale and actually uh you know i mean uh, the value of being part of a large organization, if you optimize the explore exploit trade-off and if you optimize the connections between what's localized what's centralized okay yeah. If you get that working really, really well, yeah. um, systemically, you do gain you do gain things. But my my suspicion is that most of these mergers are predicated on the basis of cost savings and efficiencies. Yeah. Okay. And therefore, you've automatically started off on the wrong foot. Instead of saying, if we combine this with that, we could do something amazing, it's if we combine this with that, we can get rid of a load of people. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, by the way, consumers may not want scale. I mean, quad play in telecoms is about as popular as a shit sandwich. People don't want their mobile phone, their television, their broadband and their landline to be with the same provider. All kinds of reasons why not, but they don't seem to want it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So if 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 you were talking to someone in middle management, Rory, this is, uh, again, someone on... Uh... If there's anybody left... <laughs> Yeah, assuming yeah. The, yeah. assuming someone's left, and they were to agree with you with what with what we're talking about, and their contention is like, "Look, man, I get it, but I'm stuck in this system. Uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm sort of deliberately presenting it as a fait, as a, as a as a fait to complain. Maybe it's not as bad as I I'm, I'm painting it to be. What would you say to such a person is it a matter of courage is it a matter of understanding and 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 each person going out there and doing whatever they can and then the pace of change is what it is well i was at this meeting yesterday and they said we're really interested in doing this okay but we need a business case first we need to make the business case yeah. And I said, you can't make a robust business case about the future because the data doesn't exist yet. So what you have what what evolution would tell you to do is you experiment. Okay. Now, if you're a large organization, one of the things you can do is instead of imposing uniformity on the organization, mm. this used to be this used to be I, I'm gonna offend a few people, but the great role of uh, I, I had a very large client which always used New Zealand. 
uh, experiments. If they had a technology they wanted to test, if they, well, if they had a thing they wanted to test, they do it in New Zealand because it's kind of like a developed country, but it's only 3 million people or 4 million people and yeah. it's a long way away. So if everything goes wrong, nobody gets <laughs> I love that. I'm, I'm going to tease my but, Kiwi but, friends. But, but uh, yeah, tease your Kiwi friends with that. But actually, I, mean, I, I always remember, I used to have Kiwi colleagues, they go, I can't believe how backward this country is because we've had chup and pun. <laughs> we've chup and pun. We've had chup and pun on our credit cards since like 1987. <laughs> Well, that's because they tested it on you first. Yeah, 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 you're, yeah, the, yeah. you're the canary in the mine. You're the guinea pig, right? But actually, New Zealand's probably done very well out of that, actually. But, but no, I mean, I think, you know, uh, the, what behavioural science, I think, does is I, I think behavioural science should stop worrying about the replication crisis. I don't I don't expect this stuff to replicate. What's important about those findings is they don't tell you things that will, in, will infinitely and unvaryingly replicate. They tell you things that are worth testing that you wouldn't have tested otherwise. Yeah, that's why they're important. Those findings. Yeah, because in a business context, you don't need universal laws. You need enough of an insight, an insight that's true enough to forge a profitable business out of it. Yeah. Okay. You don't need a hundred percent of people to behave this way all of the time, but if in a particular context people tend to do X, or sorry, if in a particular context a certain group of people are heavily predisposed to do X rather than the expected Y, you need to know about that. Yeah. OK, and um, that's what, you know, I always make this example. You know, people go, oh, the, you know, the paradox of choice doesn't replicate. We've got experiments where when you show people a lot of jam, they're more likely to buy jam, not less likely to buy jam, which is what economics would predict. Right. More choice, greater opportunity to, uh, you know, get get the right side of the price value curve. OK. But I said, look, OK, it's obviously going to be context context dependent, because if you're in a hurry, you're not really sure about whether you want to buy any jam at all. And um uh, you know, you're in a bit of a hurry and there are seven types of jam and someone says, you know, would you like any of these? You go, oh, look, black currant, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that sometimes happens. Equally, if you've driven half an hour with your family to visit a superstore called World of Jam, you're not going to look at the shelves and go, oh, my God, there's just far too much jam because you're in a different mental frame. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. this idea of looking for universal laws is exactly the opposite of what marketing should be doing. We should be looking for anomalies. I, I'm a big fan of anecdotes because I think anecdotes are a particular kind of information. Anecdotes are how significant data first emerges. Now, when you're reasoning backwards, you do use anecdotes. When you're reasoning forwards, you don't because you need robust data, yeah. okay? Because yeah. everything's got to be based on the past. And if, you, if you're right to say that we can optimize the future based on a sliver of the past, then okay, you go ahead, you go and optimize away. Go and think forwards, that's fine, okay? It's a great way to work. But if you've got to optimize for the future for which you don't have data yet, or if you're a detective, okay, what you look for as a detective is an anecdote that just tells you what to investigate more, or an anecdote that tells you what you might want to ignore. Or direction of exploration. Direction. Something direct, to... It's di beautifully put, direction of exploration. So I'll give you an example. Um, uh, in uh, If they had paid attention to an anecdote, they would have caught the Yorkshire Ripper a few years earlier, okay? Um, uh, but they were convinced that they were, they'd over-invested in the idea that the Yorkshire Ripper had a Geordie accent because of these fake tapes which were sent, okay? Yeah. And they, they'd got the mistaken idea that the person must be the perpetrator because it contained information about the crimes that hadn't appeared in the press when, in fact, it had, okay? All right, so they thought, has he got a Geordie accent? No, in which case, forget it. Don't be so fucking stupid. Stop talking about this. But it was a total anecdote just based on a sort of slightly weird encounter. I won't describe it now, but you can look it up. With a cop who, um, Andy something or other, who noticed the cops interviewing suspects. Obviously, they're visiting their homes. Their wives are usually present, okay? And they have to kind of go, how the hell do I turn up at someone's house and go... So we're just investigating you for the Yorkshire Ripper in inquiry, right? Yeah. And because, you know, you could cause all manner of problems. They also, by the way, need a, need a ruse to get the wife out of the room to make a cup of tea so they can quiz the husband about why he's in the Bradford Red Light District so frequently. <laughs> okay, right? Because you can't, otherwise you would have broken yeah, up yeah, yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, a third yeah. of the marriages in Yorkshire. And so they, they developed this little gag, okay, which was, um, right, madam, they say when they met the wife, now's your chance to put your husband get rid of your husband for good 
In other words, if you dob on him, that was a joke, Yorkshire Ripper. If you dob on your husband for being the Yorkshire Ripper, you got rid of your husband for good. By making it a joke, the whole thing was they, they said, we're just conducting routine inquiries, which we have to conduct, you know, da 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 da, da because certain people meet, you know, cars and da 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 da. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so they, they diffused the whole problem with this joke. 90% of people laughed at the joke, 10% of people got angry. Because, you know, they just get angry at the very fact they were suspected, possibly because they knew they were frequenters of the Red Light. <laughs> whatever, okay. uh, the Yorkshire Ripper was the only case where neither of them laughed. They told the joke and nobody laughed. They just went, ah. oh, right, okay. Right, yeah. Okay, now, similarly, with the capture of Levi Belfield, it came from a tip-off that I used to have this boyfriend and I discovered a magazine he had where he'd hacked the faces of all the blonde women in the magazine with a biro, okay? Now, that's not admissible in a court of law. It's not data, it's not evidence, right? But it's a significant piece of information which it's warrants- It's a signal, for, it's a signal. It's a signal which warrants, uh, your, as you put it, the direction of exploration. Absolutely. And um, as a consequence, I think, um, it's completely wrong to demand robust data before you start your journey. If you're reasoning backwards, Sherlock Holmes language, if you're practicing abductive inference, that's the language of um, uh, that's the language of Roger L. Martin and Charles Sanders Peirce. OK, you have to have what you might call a nose. You have to have a hunch. You have to have a kind of what if. Mentality. And own it and be willing yeah. to. You also have to, by the way, have the power to say, what if this data we're basing our whole inquiry on is wrong? Yeah. You know, what if there's been a mistake in the? Because otherwise, you could end up absent. You have to actually. Not only do you have to be willing to accept data that isn't robust. That's thing number one. You also have to question the data you think is robust, because in the case of the Yorkshire Ripper, it wasn't. <laughs> so that's why you need a hell of a lot of what what if questions going on, which looks to the reductionist mindset like you're shilly shallying and you're adding vagueness and, and uh, unnecessary fluff. But it's actually a necessary part of that process. Very good. Rory, we've talked a lot. I've got one final question. Of course. Which we can show a quick fire one. Uh, also came through uh, Twitter. Uh, it's around advertising. And I suppose I can rephrase it around in the form of, will uh, are there jobs you would turn down? Oh, yes. Uh, there'd be, uh, now, just to be clear, okay, there are suggestions I would make, which I would make with the strong proviso that I would not and you should not implement them. OK, now, just to be clear about that, uh, I, I can't remember making one of those suggestions, but sometimes Mount Silly gets you to somewhere interesting. And sometimes Mount, what would an unethical person do, can then be actually give you an insight which can then be lead to ethical and acceptable behaviour. OK, right. So. Uh, I, I, I do demand a kind of, just as I think you need freedom of speech in a writer's room for a comedy studio, because there, okay, there, there was a case where, you know, so the people who worked as the kind of PAs to the writer's room on comedy shows um, actually sort of sued for mental distress. Now, the problem there is that if you're in a writer's room and you're doing a comedy thing, the people are going to crack gags about totally unacceptable things like abortion that would never get onto the show, but might get into the show with the joke in a completely different form. OK. OK, so that, you know, there is a value to actually going, what, you know, what, what would a total crook do to solve this problem? You know, it's a bit, you know, it's it's the unethical version of what would Einstein do? What would Gandhi do? You know, yeah, yeah, all yeah, those yeah, marketing yeah, yeah. questions. OK. So I, I wouldn't dismiss the fact that, you know, um, uh, however, one of the values of behavioral science is you can actually spot behaviors which you said, hold on, most people would regard that as inherently unreasonable and unfair. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and uh, so I wouldn't work on sludge subscription programs where it's easy to subscribe, but impossible to unsubscribe. Mm -hmm. I think those are, those are damaging to the whole business of, of media subscription. The fact that you, people go, I'm not going to subscribe to anything else now, because every time I subscribe to something and I try and cancel, um, it's impossible to cancel without phoning Kazakhstan at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, and therefore, I'm not going to subscribe to anything else. I think it's damaging the whole market for uh, paid for media and paywall media. And so that would be a that would be a high ethical position where what I'm doing is not illegal. Yes. Um, uh, and it's not actually technically, you could say it's not unethical. But so I would argue into consideration. I, I, like I would argue but... that I would argue that it's a sludge, not a nudge. And, the, and Richard Thaler makes this distinction. 
Other things would be I'd be really, really unhappy. I've worked on vaping. OK, I'm perfectly happy working on that as a harm reduction thing. Absolutely. I wouldn't be necessarily content about working on it as an acquisition device for non-smokers. But as a migration harm reduction thing, I'm perfectly happy to do that. And I, I wouldn't I'd be very uncomfortable about working on certain things like gambling. Yeah. Um, where my problem is, particularly if you have kind of algorithmic targeting. OK, the, the truth about gambling is it's also like an alcohol is the same. Now, I will work on alcohol, but I'll, I wouldn't work on cheap alcohol. Right. I, understand. I think it's fair to say that most of the products sold by the premium alcohol manufacturers, OK, are not primarily consumed by people with an alcohol problem, although rich people with an alcohol problem probably do. OK, but I mean, rich people. Um, I, you know, and I, have, I, I have a small issue with alcohol in the sense that it's beneficial to 90 percent of people and a catastrophe for five. And yes. Quite da- well, probably quite damaging for 20 percent of people. I would argue, catastrophic for five and beneficial for 75. It's a very difficult social... Uh, it's a really difficult thing. Because, because and, the yeah. people in the 10%, there are a whole host of socioeconomic, psychological mm-hmm. considerations that I, I, I'd be lead really them to be attracted to that or any uh, other coping mechanism. So the coping mechanism, even if you got rid of the coping mechanism, and not to say we shouldn't, uh, that's a discussion to be had. But even if a particular coping mechanism is removed, that may only lead to a psychological latching on to something else. But but you're absolutely right. Algorithmic gambling is a huge problem and the link to... Uh, there, there was a case, actually, I think, where some where there's... Okay, there's a... You can put yourself on a do not admit list at mm. casinos in certain American states. So when they have those riverboat casinos, if you've got a gambling problem, you can just ask yourself to be added to a list in a sober moment where they'll just ban you from the casino and they have to mm. ban you if you're on this list. Okay, quite a good, quite a good, it's Odysseus and the sirens, you know, tie yourself to the mast. Absolutely. Okay, limit my freedom to do things. Consequently, okay, um, no, I don't think many humans, in it, both for rep- out of reputational fear and just ethical concerns, not many people would suggest mailing this list with gambling offers. OK, but I think some algorithm automatically discovered that the people who you converted from this list turned into incredibly profitable gamblers. And it just started basically blitzing them with invitations wow. to gamble. I'm fairly sure that happened somewhere. Wow. Um, it certainly could happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. And as a consequence of that, I think um, uh, you have to, you know, that the business of detaching marketing from human judgment is one we have to be concerned about because uh, there are potentially highly profitable activities which are ethically unbelievably dubious, even if they aren't technically illegal. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Which um, uh, you have to have a feel for. And, you know, so... Oh, they're there. I mean, one of the one of the principles of the ad, the ad industry is generally if you don't want, want to work on something, you don't have to work on it. Now, I mean, I suppose you could get Gen Z people who are you know go oh, I'm not happy working on capitalist clients. Okay, you know that's that's getting a little bit problematic. I mean, but then not, we'd have to go to. It's Mars, not impossible. We have government <laughs> clients. We have pro, you know pro social client, pro pro bono clients, etc. But that, 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 you know, that's probably, you know, that that would be getting a bit picky, I would argue, you know. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at it, we always talk about, oh, you're selling things to people they don't need. Most ad agencies don't do much in the way of luxury goods. Actually, those luxury brands do their own marketing. They do it in-house for various reasons because mm-hmm. they have a creative director and it's part of their whole vision and so on and so forth. Um, and... Um, uh, you know, if you look at most of my working life, you know, probably 50 percent of it or even more, actually, has been encouraging people to get broadband rather than dial up. It's going back a few years, encouraging people to get ADSL, you know, uh, uh, get fiber broadband rather than basic broadband, encouraging people to get an American Express card, which I still carry myself years later. OK, it's just effectively nudging people. You know, it's not really getting people to buy things they don't need. It's nudging people over the edge to actually get them to act where previously they were kind of in a state of inertia. And we shouldn't um, forget all the all the public uh, beneficial ideas uh, I mean, I know um, you would advocate of, you know, for example, trains and infrastructure, how we can solve those problems. Say mate uh, to a mate. I mean, that was my team uh, were very instrumental behind that. And absolutely. the point was that if you have a friend who's behaving inappropriate towards a woman, most men don't like this, but they don't have a vocabulary or a, or a word to call it out. Because 
you know, if, you, if you're out with a few mates and someone is basically practising mild misogyny, you don't start reading them Guardian editorial, do you? OK, so giving them something to say, it's based on the idea of designated driver. If you give a name for the behaviour, then the name creates a norm. Absolutely. And, it, it you know, and as a, and so giving people effectively the tools to intervene without basically their friends, you know, thinking they're being a twat. Yeah. Um, it was always interesting is a lot of people got very angry about that campaign. The person who got it instantly, all credit to him, was Piers Morgan, who said, yeah, I get how it works. That makes sense. I might say, mate, yeah. OK, I wouldn't say, uh, according to this latest edition of, you yeah. know, The Guardian, what you're doing is actually practising, uh, you know, yes, toxic right. masculinity. OK, that's that yeah. that's not going to work. Absolutely. Rory, we've, I've taken... It's a huge time. pleasure. Absolute joy. Thank, Thank you, you so very much, much indeed.